everyone and welcome to Getting Started with World Creator 2. My name is Tyler and in this series I'm going to cover the basics you will need to know to creating a realistic landscape for your projects, whether that would be for game engines, cinematics, or even just regular imagery. Now, if you don't already know, World Creator 2 is a real-time terrain generator created by Byte the Bytes, and you can find their software here at their website, worldcreator.com, and make sure you put that little dash between World Creator, otherwise you'll be going somewhere completely different. So this program makes the process to creating a digital landscape much easier and quicker to give you the results you need. Here at their website, you can go through and see all the advantages the software has to offer and the differences between the versions you can purchase. So if you wanted to see everything that the software has to offer, just go to the features and you can browse through this whole page of, of well, when it loads, of everything that you could do. Um, but for the purposes of having full functionality in this series, I will be using the professional version of the software. And if by chance you have just the standard version, no worries, as much of the same practices you will learn here should apply to the standard versions as well. So if you don't know the differences between the professional and the standard version, just make sure you go to and click on buy, scroll down and you can see standard professional and enterprise. Um, and so you can just scroll down the list and see everything that's part of the standard version, everything that's part of the professional version. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over step by step with surface modeling, texturing, uh, making basic roads and rivers, using assets like shrubs and trees, and finally exporting the terrain to multiple formats such as Unity 5, Unreal Engine 4, uh, even 3DS Max, uh, Marmoset Toolback 3, just different different versions. But before we go into that, I wanted to go over the user interface to show you your way around what you'll be using. So up first, here on the left, this is the left toolbar. And at the top, you can see you can create a new project, which will take you back to the home screen to, to open up a new project or load an old one. And you could also save this project, which is typical. And this button, enable heat maps, and we'll go over what that does later. But essentially, this function shows you um, things like areas and surfaces of where you're actually editing, but that'll make more sense whenever we cover that later down in another video. And this button for is called Observer Tools, and this is pretty handy. So as you, wherever your cursor is over the terrain, if you see up in the top right hand corner right here, it'll show you the X, Y, and Z, the Z being the elevation of what where that cursor is located on the terrain in meters. Another piece of handy information that this uh, shows is the lowest level on the Z axis and the maximum level on the Z axis your terrain is. So you see my terrain starting out as 55.61 meters below sea level and 254.67 meters above sea level. So that's pretty handy so you can get a good scale of, of what you're dealing with. So we're going to turn that off right now. And then the next button is to enable the compass, which you see here at the top, it shows the north area. So if we pan with the right mouse button, and uh, sorry, if we uh, scroll around with the right mouse button and we pan with the middle mouse button, you can see, though, that the north arrow changes. Now, to focus back to where we were originally, just press F and it'll go back to the original image. And another good key command to remember is the compass, which is C. So you press the C, C command. Well, it's not working right now. And another good button to, to use is the enable wireframe mode, which this puts the entire ter terrain into a wireframe. And you could see the exact polygons and uh, vertices and lines that each of the areas of the terrain will have. And I'll show you all the details be behind these, these polygons in a later video. So we're going to turn that off so we can have better functionality. And right here, you see a button that says take screenshot. Now, the default, if you don't want to press this button, the default for that to toggle a to take a screenshot is F12. Now, what the regular screenshot is going to do is just take a take a screenshot of whatever the resolution of your screen is. But we're going to swap on over here and go to options real quick. Go under general. 
and you can see where it says make super size screenshot and you see the resolution of that screenshot. So what this is, is if you want to take a super size screenshot, you could scale this factor of what your resolution is. So to toggle your screen or to make this whole thing full screen, just hit F10 and it'll go into a full screen mode so you can lower the or remove the toolbar, which is pretty handy whenever you're wanting to do a screenshot. So F10 does that. And to take a super size screenshot, it's F11. And a regular screenshot, which is, as we discussed, the resolution of your monitor, is F12. For the purposes of whatever you're wanting to do, if you're wanting to make a screenshot within, I would just go ahead and just make a super size screenshot so you can get the full pixels of whatever this resolution is. Now I want to go under the options and general tab. And as we've already talked about the screenshot version, we're going to talk about the rest of the features on this screen. So the first one is real time generation mode and real time generation mode basically runs all of the terrain immediately. So you don't have to hit render and wait for all the terrain features to, to generate out. This is literally you make an erosion or you make a road and it happens instantaneously. And this is all run entirely on the GPU. So you want to go online and check your check the uh, recommended GPU settings and the max resolution that the GPU will render out on the terrain is 8K. So if you check this and turn it off, what's going to happen is you see it already downscaled to the lower resolution. I might want to go ahead and press it because it looks much better. But if real time is off, Roll Creator 2 goes into what's called streaming mode. And essentially, every time you make a change of some kind to the terrain, you have to press the g generate button, which you will see. I'm going to go ahead and just turn this off. You'll see under the surface tab, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom, but you'll see generate. All right, so this mode is not ideal for performance since it has to write the data to your hard drive. So this runs best if you have an SSD, whether that be an SSD through SATA or a PCI Express based. So this takes up a lot of extra space and a lot of extra time that's just not necessary. So it's always best just to keep this in real time mode and it runs so much faster. We're not going to get into multi-frame generation just yet as it is not complete, but basically this renders the terrain across multiple frames instead of just one. It's supposed to help slower machines run the terrain generation faster, uh, but again, that, that hasn't come out just yet, so we'll see that later on. And we've already gone over the screenshot properties. And you can see down here the UI properties, they're pretty simple. You can do the scale of the UI, whether that's super big, but it's best just to keep that at 100. And you can go through the different colors of the UI. So green, orange, magenta, and the original version used, used to look like this, but I prefer the dark blue as it looks pretty nice. And this window size, you don't have to worry about this unless you're actually running in the window instead of full screen. So window, let me scroll down. So the window, this would be windowed. And this basically adjusts the resolution of the window. But in full screen, it just automatically snaps to the to the, your whatever your resolution of your um, your monitor is. OK, so now we're going to look under the graphics panel, which is a sub panel underneath the options tab. So at the top, you have shadow properties and we're just going to go down this list one by one. So shadow distance is essentially the distance your camera is away from the shadow and when it renders. So watch when I zoom out, you can see the shadow starts to disappear. And when I zoom back in, the shadow reappears. And that's really handy for performance, especially if you have a really large terrain. Now I'm going to zoom in on the shadow here and you can see how jaggedy this is. Well, watch what happens when I when I adjust the what is this the sh shadow strength. The shadow strength right now is down to zero. But when I pull this up, you can see the shadow kind of blends out. By default, this is all the way at, at one. So if I hit F and go back, you can see the shadow is really nice. And if I zoom back in, it's got a really nice zero to one uh, blend here for performance. If you want to get a good, heavy, decent performance, just prop this down to zero as whenever you're doing your actual terrain generation, shadow doesn't really matter a whole lot, or at least not to me. So 
that's just a pretty good handy little performance feature. We're not going to go over Shadow Bias and Shadow Normal Bias as I just keep those where they are right now. One big thing that you want to not check, at least unless you're doing a, a rendering within the application, is reflections. This is a heavy performance loss, but it's pretty handy whenever you're wanting to do a render. So I'm going to hit reflections and you can see the terrain turned white. But what this does, it, it just essentially sounds what it sounds like. It's the sun putting a reflection on whatever the terrain is. And this, if you have to have the reflections on, I would recommend setting it at 0.4. Watch what happens when I go any, anywhere above 0.4. I'm just going to grab it and scroll it up. So you get anything above one, you start looking like snow, but this is without a texture. So um, if you have a texture, it's just going to make that whatever that texture brighter and brighter to the point where you can't see any texture. So a good middle ground that I like to use is just 0 0.4 and it covers a good basis. But while you're doing all your texturing, while you're generating your model, the best just to keep that off as you'll have a much better performance. And down here, this HDR, which stands for High Dynamic Range, and I'm sure most of you know what that is, but you won't have to worry about this unless you're doing a rendering within the, uh, the application. This is a pretty handy one, the color correction. It's on by default, and basically this just handles the saturation of the, of the entire interface. Well, not interface, but the, the window of the model. So I'm going to check it off. You can see how desaturated it looks, so we're wanting to color correct that and make it look a lot better. By default, it's set to one. You go anywhere left. It'll, you can make it a black and white image if you want, or you can take it all the way to two and make it some type of cartoon you need to look in colors. But we're going to just keep this at the default at one, and that's usually what you should mostly keep it at. And the color effect, like this is pretty handy if you're wanting to create a certain... Um, if you have a scene that's tropical or a desert or Arctic or any particular color that you're wanting to go about, you can specify a, a LUT or an LUT, which you may or may not know what that is. And I don't have the exact best explanation myself for it. Uh, there's plenty of videos out there that explain what a LUT is, but basically it's a it's a custom color um, that your camera will see or pick up for all of the terrain. So by default, there's plenty here that, that comes with the software, but me, I just check this off and I don't really use that a whole lot. Definitely keep motion blur off. So what camera motion blur is literally just the camera in the UI. So I'm gonna zoom in. Well, hold on, let me turn this uh, on first. So I'm gonna zoom in. You can kind of vaguely see a little bit of, of motion blur that happens but it's best just to keep that off for performance sake. And bloom, you can turn your bloom on and off. This is another type of reflection back to the camera from the sun. Um, you could change that intensity to threshold, which changes the wideness of the color or of the angle of the, of the uh, reflection. But it's also performance intensive. I also keep the uh, ambient occlusion off. This is pretty cool, though, because when you zoom in the shadows, it's more apparent. So this is when it's on and this is with it off. So obviously the ambient occlusion gives a really good detail in your shadows, but for performance sake, and really you should just have this off while you're you're doing your modeling, unless you have a heavier, um, you know, much more powerful GPU, it just make, helps your uh, system run much better. And then also under here is a vignette. And really just this is just a post processing effect that you would you would want to use if you're creating an image within the uh, the render and then the depth of field. I always keep this off. It's unnecessary unless you're creating a rendering within the engine. So I have to zoom in really far to see any detail whatsoever. So it's not good to use that while you're you're generating your model. But you can do all the settings here, play around with them to get the exact uh, depth of field uh, effect. All right, we're going to skip anamorphic flares and go down to sun flares. And I've readjusted that. Whoa, I've readjusted the camera to the direction of the light. And we're going to click sun flares. And now you can see the sun appears. Now, what this does is it's just a post processing effect, especially if you're wanting to do an image within the render. So you can set the color of the sun, the intensity of how bright it is, the size of the sun itself or the, the disk of the image, the diffraction intensity 
which basically it, it just um, changes the amount of the solar wind that you can see around, which you can also change that in the solar wind speed, how fast it goes. It's best to keep this on a really low uh, number if you're wanting to do like an in, in engine um, rendering, like a film or something. And then the diffraction threshold, which essentially, as you can see, just changes the amount of the diffraction in, in itself. We're going to turn that off and press F and go back to the same focus. Here we press lens dirt and lens dirt. I don't see a whole lot in it, but it's really just a post processing effect uh, for the camera, which if you're doing any type of post processing effect like uh, for example, vignette or lens dirt, um, you could simply do a much better job in Photoshop or GIMP or something like that. But this is a nice little, these are nice little post-processing add-ons that are within the software that you don't really see a whole lot. And last for the options under camera, this essentially adjusts as it sounds the camera and you can adjust the look sensitivity, the distance to speed this dependent speed. Now I don't have this because I like it to be always zoom in and zoom out fast with my scroll wheel. But this, if you have this checked, the speed at which you zoom in is very dependent on where your mouse is. So the closer to the terrain you get, the slower the, the zoom is and the further away from the terrain you get, the faster the zoom is. So it's, it's pretty handy, but I just by default have that always uh, checked off because I'm a speeds guy. I like to be really fast and get to the terrain quick. This move speed and move multiplier is all based on the typical game keys, WASD, which moves up, up, down, left, and right. So here I'm, I'm moving um, in and out, I guess would be in and out would be uh, W and S. D moves you right and A moves you left. E moves you up in the Z axis and Q moves you down in the Z axis. So we're going to go back and press F. And uh, but obviously you can do the typical 3D motion curve uh, tools so you can just zoom in with the mouse and, you know, pan around with the right mouse button and middle mouse button. So you you should get the gist of what what these are. Um, so the field of view, I just keep that at 70. You don't have to do anything funky, but we're just going to change this so you guys can see. It gets really weird once you get a high, but. It's best just for your eyes sake to keep that at 70. Now, the near clip plane and the far clip plane is very interesting um, to adjust. So if you have a huge landscape, like something bigger than 20K, you're going to and you want to see that distance, you're going to set this clip plane up higher. So what this is, is when I zoom out, you're going to see that the train is going to clip sometime soon. There it is. So you can see that it's clipping at 10,000 meters. Let's zoom in. And the near clip plane is the complete opposite. So at, at a 0.3 meters, once I get within 0.3 meters, you're going to see the terrain also clip. I guess it's a bad example. Let's go at a different angle. All right, so that's that's a better better example. So you can see it clip, and you can adjust these clippings uh, to whatever your your likings are. But by default, it's set to ten thousand. I usually like to go up to twenty thousand because I like to see my terrain pretty far. But that could be performance intensive, especially if you have a whole lot into the scene. So just adjust that to whatever your system needs are and whatever your personal needs are, and you should be okay. So now I'm just going to go do a quick overview of what each one of these tabs are. We're going to cover each tab and what they are and all the details underneath on later videos. But I'm just going to run through them to give you guys a quick overview of what each one does. So the first one is surface and the sub sub tab would be base. So what this does is this category uh, controls all of your surface features, the, the scale, the size, the terrain, the, it, it, it essentially gives you all the tools you need to generate the landscape in any shape, form or fashion. The other sub tab is filters and the filters is just adds effects to the terrain or effects such as adding erosion, making mountains, making dunes, or even flattening it, adding a spiral, just different features that add up on top of the generator itself. So it's kind of like a, essentially what it sounds like a filter to what the generator is outputting. And the next we have the texturing tab and under textures, it's essentially just 
adding all the textures of the landscape and you can add layers that you see right here, just like in Photoshop or in GIMP. So you can add texture on top of texture on top of texture. Now the next tab under, under texturing is the general tab. And this is basically setting the properties or the details of all the textures that you have. For the modeling purposes, it's best to keep all of these off. Um, so later we can add a height based textures, which is, takes the height map of each of the textures and applies a tessellation effect or triplanar, which allows the texture to not be stretched by the terrain in the Z plane. Perlin noise, which el helps eliminate or adds more texturing across the entire terrain between textures and eliminate tiling, which is a, diff a different type of Perlin noise that gets that tiling effect of that textures typically have out of the fact. And this tes tessellation factor adjusts the height based textures of the height map and how the landscape is using that height map to show things like rocks and grass and, and dirt. It just adds height to the terrain in addition to what's being generated. But again, for modeling purposes, it's best just to keep all these off because it really adds a performance uh, impact on your machine. But for whenever you do a rendering within World Creator 2, it's, you, could, you definitely want to have all of these, all of these checked. The next tab to go, we're going to go over is the scene tab, and there's several subcategories in this tab. We're going to go over each one really quick. The first one's the objects tab. This is essentially adding objects to the scene, such as trees, shrubs, buildings, signs, anything of that nature. The de details tab is just like the objects tab, but it's for adding smaller assets, such as flowers and grass and rock. So it, it adds much more depth to all of the assets. And it's it's got different sets of controls because it adds more of an impact to the scene. And the next tab is the oceans tab. And essentially, this doesn't do anything for exporting an ocean to a, another platform like Unity 5 or Unreal Engine 4. This is strictly just a visual aid within the software or for making imagery within World Creator 2. But we're going to go ahead and press show ocean plane. And you can see it adds an animated ocean. Well, I guess we're going to zoom in so you can see the animation. And you... You can adjust all of these animations within the ocean, which is pretty cool with the, the color, the specularity, the reflection, the scattering and how fast the water moves. But they are pretty performance intensive the closer you get. So by default, I just keep the scattering and the water droplets down to zero and you can adjust the height in meters. So by default, it's set to zeros. And this is where the. Uh, enable observer tools comes in so you can see the ocean is set at zero meters and if you want to pump this up say 50 it moves the ocean up 50 meters and there's a lot of extra details that are based on this ocean plane we could set textures based on this we could set surface filters based on the ocean level so that is a really handy tool that we're going to cover later Next up, we have the weather tab, and this is also just some post-processing effects. Uh, you can able, enable fog and the wind. The wind really just does things like it adjusts the wind effects to the objects in detail. So it makes the trees move, the grass move, the shrubs move, and it's got all the features and settings that you can adjust to see how fast those things move. But we're not going to cover all of these settings just yet. We'll cover those in a later video when we actually set up a scene uh, because they could be pretty time into uh, intuitive for these uh, for this video and the last one is the sky so the best thing for whenever you're wanting to create a realistic image within world creator it's best just to go ahead and hit realistic mode as it provides really nice uh, a really nice sky and let me just zoom in right here trying to get the terrain to clip the sky here we go so you can see the sky is ever so slightly moving and you can adjust the sun settings you can adjust the clouds you can even adjust the day and night cycle so let's make this nighttime oh no it's so awesome so you can see it's nighttime and you can adjust how bright the moon is you can do all these settings but as I said, we're going to adjust, we're going to talk about those in a completely later video so you can get the real gist of what all these features do.
So under realistic mode, we have world in scatter, and essentially this is the atmospheric fog. And we're going to show you exactly what this does later with a much larger terrain, but not right now. And then you can adjust also underneath the sun properties, but the sun properties are best um, used, especially when you click realistic mode. You can adjust all the sun properties under here, which is really interesting, the direction, the exposure, how bright it is. And like I said before, we're gonna cover those in a later video when we set up a scene. And the last tab I wanna go over is the areas tab. And this is one of the best features in this entire program. But we're gonna cover the areas tab in many videos later on. But essentially, areas essentially establishes a shape or a painting on the surface to apply many, many different effects and outcomes. It's helped used to create roads, rivers, canyons, used to apply textures and terrain filters. It's essentially a universal tool within World Creator 2. It's one of the best tools out there and I've never seen anything like this in a terrain generator and it's really cool and I can't wait to show it to you. So now that you know your way around the software a little, in the next video we are going to discuss the basics to creating a surface from the surface tab and go over each and every step from start to finish. Till then, I'll see you in the next one.